Welcome to my channel, I'm Scott, and in this video I am going to walk you through the process of valuing Castor Maritime stock by analyzing their financial statements and dissecting their financial ratios so we can determine if it's a buy or a sell. Castor Maritime leases ships to various companies and those companies use the vessels to transport oil, coal, grain, etc. Most companies sign an agreement to take possession of the ship for a predetermined period, such as three months. The amount Castor charges these companies is a flat or floating amount based on the market rates and various other factors. In the fourth quarter of 2021, on average each day, 27 vessels were in operation earning on average $22,300 per day. This is a major improvement from the fourth quarter of 2020, which had 5.8 vessels in operations per day, earning $9,900. During the fourth quarter of 2021, it added three vessels, two Panamax dry bulk carriers and one Aframax tanker. Now it currently has 29 vessels with an aggregate capacity of 2.5 million deadweight tons. This is more than four times the number of vessels it owned in 2020. In order to continue trading on the NASDAQ and meet the $1 minimum stock price, the company did a 1 for 10 reverse stock split in May 2021. The supply of ships in the market is highly correlated to the profitability of shipping companies. The cost to maintain a ship is fairly fixed depending on the age of the ship. The revenue each ship receives can vary a lot depending on the number of ships in the entire market. There will always be demand by companies looking to transport products across the ocean. To transport items within any country or within landlocked countries, using railroad is ideal. For example, transporting cargo from Africa to the United States by plane is too expensive since you cannot fit that much product on a plane. Shipping by vessels is the only viable option. When the number of ships in the market falls, then the remaining ships are able to charge more per delivery. When a shipping company makes a lot of money, they usually buy more ships to grow. When the number of ships in the market gets too high again, the shipping companies are unable to demand higher prices and they start to lose money. This vicious cycle seems to happen quite often in the shipping industry. Castor's average fleet age is 13.7 years, which is higher than the average vessel in the market. Older vessels are usually less fuel efficient and more costly to maintain. Cargo insurance rates also increase with the age of a vessel. As vessels age, market conditions might not justify the added expense, so scrapping the ship may be the best option. To put it simply, you want to invest in shipping companies when there are less ships in the market and you want to sell your shipping stocks when the market has too many ships. 20 of the company's 29 ships transport dry bulk cargo, like coal and grain. A way to gauge the profitability of this company is to track the Baltic Dry Index. This is an index of average prices paid for the transport of dry bulk materials across more than 20 routes. This index reflects the supply and demand for this industry. In 2007 and 2008, dry bulk shippers were making money hand over fist, as you can see from the extremely high rates on this chart. The company is headquartered in Cyprus and was founded in 2016. The ticker trades on the NASDAQ, Norway OTC, and Deutsche Börse. Let's get started with the model. This is a micro cap company, 152 million market cap. They're trading at 161 a share and they have 95 million shares outstanding. Let's look at their financials. The way you value a company is you estimate the free cash flows into the future and then you discount those numbers back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. Net income is the profit or loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses. And that looks really good in 2021, positive 52 million. Revenue is a sales for the company and their revenue grew more than 30 times from 4 million to 132 million. Just amazing growth. This is the company's income statement. The top line is the revenue of the sales. Below that is the cost of revenue. These are the expenses directly related to generating the revenue. The cost to maintain the vessels, such as insurance, is part of cost of revenue. Revenue minus cost of revenue gives you your gross profit, and that grew from 1.6 million up to 65 million. Below that is their operating expenses. 
payroll for support functions as part of operating expenses. Gross profit minus operating expenses gives you your operating income. And that grew from 1 million to 55 million. Below that is the interest they pay in their debt, and they paid the most interest, 2.8 million in 2021. But looking at this number on its own is kind of meaningless. You need to compare it to operating income. If their operating income was below 5 million, I'd be concerned with paying this much interest. But having so much operating income, they can easily afford the interest payments. Below that is other income and expenses. These are all the gains or losses not part of the company's core operations, and that's really small each year. Below that is their pre-tax income, then their taxes, and the bottom line of the income statement is their net income, which is huge in 2021 compared to prior years. This is the company's income statement directly from their financial reporting, so this gives us a little more info than Yahoo Finance. This shows us 2020, 2021, the fourth quarter of 2020, and the fourth quarter of 2021. And it's really unbelievable revenue growth. 4.4 million up to 60 million. In the fourth quarter of 2021, their revenue is five times more than all of 2020. They spent 5.8 million of expenses on their vessels, 15 million of operating expenses. This includes insurance and parking the ships between voyages, 1.2 million of general and administrative expenses. This would include payroll and rent for its corporate office, 2.1 million of management fees. So it pays third parties to help them manage the vessels. Depreciation is always going to be a big expense for this company because they carry the assets, the vessels on their balance sheet and depreciate them over 20 years. So that was five and a half million in the fourth quarter. Their operating income went from negative half a million to positive 31 million. All of 2020, their operating income was half a million. So it's 60 times more just in the fourth quarter of 2021. They spent 1 million of interest on their debt. It was 260,000 in the fourth quarter of 2020. They needed to add debt in order to acquire more vessels. Their taxes are only 300,000 on 30 million of operating income. The reason it's so low is they're carrying forward losses from prior years. Their net income looks amazing, 29 million which is more than half their net income in all of 2021. So the fourth quarter was their best quarter by far. It was probably better than all the other quarters combined. The two most important numbers for this company are utilization and the rate they charge. And their utilization is almost 100%. In the fourth quarter of 2020, it was 98%. In 2021, it was 99%. The expenses are pretty fixed. They're pretty flat. 5,800 in the fourth quarter of 2020, and that went up to 6,000. The thing that varies a lot is how much they charge, the rates. And you can see the rates more than doubled from 10,000 to 22,000. That's why they're so profitable in the fourth quarter. This is the company's statement of cash flows. The top line is operating cash flow. That's how much cash the company generates or loses from its operational business. You could think of operating cash flow as net income converted to cash because net income is your accounting profit or loss. It's not actual cash. They generated lots of cash flow in 2021, 61 million. This is the cash that's remaining after paying all your day-to-day -day expenses. They spent a lot on CapEx, nearly 350 million in 2021. Operating cash flow minus CapEx gives you your free cash flow. And that's why they had such a big negative in 2021, all the vessels they acquired. In the fourth quarter of 2021, they spent 36 million in CapEx and they acquired three vessels. So they paid an average of $12 million per vessel. The price of the vessel does vary a lot depending on the type of vessel and the age. They're mainly funding their growth on stock. They raised 265 million from issuing stock in 2021 and almost 50 million in 2020. Every time a company issues common stock, it increases the shares outstanding and makes your shares less valuable. Since they're cash flow positive, they added almost 100 million of debt in 2021. They also paid down 12 million of debt. This is their operating cash flow section from their statement of cash flows. And the way to calculate operating cash flow, you start with your net income or net loss. Then you have to add or subtract the non-cash items on the income statement. 14 million of depreciation, that brings down their net income, but it's a non-cash item, so we add it back here. 
And then we have to adjust for changes in working capital. Even though they reported a net profit of 52 million, they actually generated nearly 61 million of cash flow. Last year was a net loss of 1.8 million, but lost 2.3 million of cash flow. This is their revenue and operating cash flow since 2017. 2021 was their breakout year. It was pretty much flat until then, and then they just took off. This is their investing and financing sections on their statement of cash flows. The acquisition of vessels falls into investing. That was 35 million in 2020, 346 million in 2021. In 2020, they raised equity to acquire those vessels. In 2021, they raised equity and debt, 97 million of debt, to acquire these vessels. This is the equity section on their 1231 balance sheet. They raised 304 million from selling common stock, and they do have positive retained earnings of 39 million. So their equity balance is pretty high. Let's look at the capital structure. 343 million of equity, 100 million of debt. They're 77% equity, 23% debt. This blue line is the equity balance since 2017. The red line is the debt balance and the green line is the cash balance. So their equity balance grew a lot the past year. Because when a company issues stock, it increases their equity balance. When a company issues debt, their debt goes up and their equity goes up because they receive cash for that debt. In this case, they use a debt to buy vessels, so that keeps their equity balance high. But if they use that debt to pay employee salary or maybe there was a lawsuit, then that debt would not improve their equity balance. And I gave them the highest whack on Finbox, 13% because they just started becoming profitable and I'm not quite sure if they'll be able to maintain this type of profitability going forward, especially given the fact rates are so volatile, you never know where they're gonna go. And this is the discount rate we're gonna apply to the future cash flows. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated the terminal value, which is all cash flows past year for, that's 264 million. We discounted those numbers back to today using the weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $231 million. We divide that by 95 million shares. And we get a calculated stock price of 244. They're trading at 161, so they're trading at a 34% discount. It's a buy according to the model. Their revenue grew a ton the past few years. There's just no way they can maintain that type of revenue growth because their revenue grew 12 times from 2020 to 2021. Let's just pretend their revenue doubles for the next four years. That implies the company is worth $2.1 billion and the stock should be worth $23 a share. I gave them a more modest growth rate of 10%. So I grew their revenue 10% for the next four years. That's how I got their future revenue estimates. The average company in their industry converts 14% of their revenue into free cash flow. So I multiplied their future revenue estimates by 14%. That's how I got their future free cash flows. So I think it's a fairly conservative model, but it does seem like the stock could 10x, but it's really hard to imagine them doing that. But based off of how well they did in 2021, it seems possible. This is where the stock has been trading the past two years. According to this chart, the stock was trading a little below $75 a share. We know that's not possible for this company. In May of 2021, they did a 10 for one reverse stock split. So to figure out how much they were trading on any day before May, you have to divide these numbers by 10. In May of 2019, it looks like they were trading at $50 on this chart. So we have to divide that by 10. So that means they were trading at $5 on this day. The numbers after May 2021 are the actual prices they were trading at. The stock must have fell below $1. That's why they did the reverse stock split, so they wouldn't get delisted. This is much easier to see this chart. It's just the past three months. This is all after the stock split. It was trading over $3 at one point, and then it fell below $1 again. But if you bought the stock back here, it looks like the end of January you probably could have quadrupled your investment just after a month. The stock has done well since this point due to their blockbuster fourth quarter. They have a beta of 0.49, so the stock moves about half the market. It's gone down 85% in the past 52 weeks while the S&P is up 11%. The 52-week low is $1, the high is 12. 
and the stock is trading between its 50 day and 200 day moving average. 6 million shares have been traded on average each day the past 10 trading days. Pretty much all the shares outstanding are on float, only 4% are held by institutions and 2% of the shares are shorted. If you invested $10,000 into this company when they IPO'd, you'd be at $326 today. That's what happens with reverse stock splits. It really negatively affects the stock price. 96% of the company is held by the general public and 4% by institutions. The biggest shareholder is Renaissance Technology at 1.2%, then Citadel, Susquehanna, Savvy Management, and L1 Capital. They have a really low PE ratio of 2.9. So it does appear the stock is a really good value, or it could be a value trap. They have a price to sales of 1.2 and a price to book of 0.4. Price to book is stock price of a book value per share. This indicates that if the company sold all its assets, used that money to pay off all its liabilities, it would have enough money left over to give each shareholder $3.62. The company is worth twice as much in bankruptcy as it is as an active company. Let's look at their non-current assets. They have nearly $400 million of vessels on their balance sheet. When they buy a ship, they put the entire value of the ship on its balance sheet, then depreciate that dollar amount over the next 20 years. Their return on invested capital is 11%. They can cover their interest payments with their operating income 20 times. They have a high ROE of 15%. That's net income over equity. They have a good current ratio and quick ratio of 1.6. Let's look at their current assets, 37 million of cash, 2.4 million of restricted cash. Restricted cash is cash that's set aside for a specific purpose, like for example, to acquire another vessel, and 15 million of other. Let's look at their current liability, 16 million of debt, four and a half million due to other parties, and 13 million of other. Their free cash flow in 2021 was negative 288 million. Assuming they don't buy that many more vessels in 2022, they should have positive free cash flow and they have 21 million of working capital so they should have enough funding to get through the next 12 months because I can't imagine them buying that many more ships since they bought so many in 2021 the best way to look at ratios is to compare them to companies in the same industry there are 34 companies in the same industry as Castor and Castor spends a lot more than average in CapEx. They have a better debt to equity ratio. Most companies in this industry pay a dividend, they do not. They rank 21st in market cap at 152 million, and their price multiples are amazing. When you see a PE this good, that usually means the company is about to file bankruptcy. Because why would a company have so much in earnings, but nobody buy the stock? Because there's some concern the company's in trouble. But we saw they had their best quarter ever in the fourth quarter. So it does not appear this company is in trouble. It does appear the stock is really, really undervalued. And they have a good ROA and ROE, a lot better than the average. So to summarize, I have them trading at a 34% discount. I'd be really concerned about buying this stock. If they do well in 2022, then maybe I would consider buying it. But if they do well this year, then the stock will go up a ton and it won't be undervalued anymore. I guess the greater the risk, the greater the reward. I rank their free cash flow as 1 out of 10, their revenue 7 out of 10, and their ratio is 10 out of 10. So let me know what you think. Give this video a like, subscribe, or comment below. Also, if you'd like to get a custom valuation or just support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.